I'm going to talk about a concept today uh, which uh, overturns all the e economics. Uh, I'm sitting next to a professor of economics, I'm a bit nervous about that. So, the concept is what I call enoconics, which is a mix between energy and economics. And it's useful in biology, in ancient history, energy and economics. I'll summarise the talk first. Uh, I'm going to be saying that money and energy are very much the same thing. I'm going to be telling you that we are all slave owners. And I want you to believe that at the end of the talk. And I'm going to be saying that madcap green energy schemes will destroy our economy. I think you probably remember, already believe that. So. But first I'll go into the Scottish Climate and Energy Forum. We're a group of skeptics, a uh, voluntary organisation, and we very much believe in what most of the climate scientists believe. The world warmed the 20th century, CO2 is rising, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, the, the greenhouse effect of CO2 for a doubling of the quantity in the, in the atmosphere would lead to about one degree C of rising. Where we disagree with the climate scientists is that their models don't work. As the poor show, they can't predict the climate. I've, uh, my experience, I've got an MBA, I've got, uh, as the thing said, I've, uh, I did a science degree at St. Andrews University with engineering, I worked in industry, I've got an MBA, um, around about 2000 I was a member of the British Wind Energy Association and the Scottish Parliamentary Renewable Energy Group. Um, as a result of that I did research into the development of renewable energy around about 2000 as a result of that, I became a sceptic of the uh, government wind policy. I, I never thought they would produce the jobs they said they would. And later, I became a climate sceptic. So let's start with a very simple concept of what is energy. It's a very simple concept. My son said, when I asked him, uh, and it's very profound, energy is the power to make us do things. That's about doing things. It's also about power. If we look at the independence debate, it's all, the, fun, the foundation for independence is seen as North Sea oil. When North Sea oil started to run out, the foundation turned, political emphasis turned to renewable energy. So renewable energy and oil are part of the foundation for an independent Scotland as put forward by the SNP. Coriolis was the first one to use it in a more scientific sense. Uh, he said it's the work done uh, by, for instance, lifting up a weight. Here we have a grandfather, the mechanism of a grandfather clock. As you turn the handle, you do work, the weight lifts up, and then slowly the weight falls down, doing work. Now that work could be done by somebody else, by a person doing it instead. So energy is work. Here we have a water mill. Again, we have water coming in the top, the weight goes onto the side of the water mill, it comes, pushes down, the wheel turns round, it can then be used to do work in the form of grinding corn or, turn, or using the textile mill. And it's very much the same as a human or an animal doing the same work. We got to the age of steam or the age of uh, industrial revolution. We started burning coal, we started heating water, the water turned into steam. The steam can be used to, uh, in a piston. Again, it does work. It turns a wheel. It started to replace people. If, if energy was cheaper, it was used instead of people. We then had the Luddites saying, all this machinery is going to put us out of work. It didn't put people out of work. People, we still employ people today, even, there are, even though there are machines. And the result, and, <laughs> So, the amount of work being done in society increased because of machinery. Now, I want to talk about GDP. Very simple concept. GDP is total earnings from work. The sum total of what everyone in society earns. Inflation adjusted, there's a few other things as well, the balancing in terms of savings and so on. But if GDP goes up, earnings go up. And in a balanced economy, what we earn is what we spend, unless it's the Gordon Brown government, in which case uh, we all go into crisis. 
Right, basket of goods. Now, the key to understanding what is meant by money comes in the way we calculate inflation. Inflation is calculated based on the average, a typical basket of goods. Here we've got groceries and white goods, uh, a video, I think. If that basket of goods increases in price by 10%, inflation increases by 10%. What that also means is the average worker can buy more goods. We can take out the money from the middle, we say the average earner earns a certain wage, that wage can buy so many goods. If GDP goes up, the amount of goods we can buy increases. So GDP is a measure of how many goods we can buy, the, 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 the amount, the consumption capacity of the average person. So both Energy and GDP are related to work. Energy is the work done per unit energy, and GDP per person is the basket of goods that can be purchased by the work done by the average worker. So both of these are concepts to do with work, and energy relates to both of them. Right, I, I suspect I'm gonna pick the earliest data um, in the whole talk. Uh, Early man, when he came down, when she, sorry, when she came down to the, the trees, had no clothes, had no fire, and had few tools. Uh, we warmed ourselves by internal body heat. So the total energy consumption of the average person <coughs> was what we ate. The food we ate, about well, 3,000 calories, was our total energy consumption. We then, about a million years ago, discovered fire. That fire increased our energy consumption and it then improved our standard of living. About 10,000 to 2000 BC, we started to domesticate animals. Those animals started to do work for us. That, those animals needed to be, fed, to, to be fed with fodder, so that increased our energy consumption. It also increased our prosperity. It also increased the amount of work the average person did. We have here a farmer. They're doing more work as a result of that, that animal than they would on their own. So the amount of work done, the amount of energy consumed, it started to increase. And it's, as I say, the, the, the energy consumption per person increased. Now, I want to try and convince you that we're all still slave owners. And the reason we're still all slave owners is in the past, if you were a Roman, you would live in a big villa with lots of people doing the work for you. Today, we are still slave owners, but the slaves we have are mechanical slaves. We have our chariot, instead of a slave driving us somewhere in our chariot, we have our cars. We have our hypercourse system. So instead of a slave sitting there, um, stoking the fire to keep us warm, we have mechanical devices that do the job of, or do the work of those slaves. We have people to wash. I know that very well because our washing machine is broken down and I spent yesterday trampling up and down in the bath, trying to do the wash, and it's, it's hard work. I have forgotten how much work is involved in doing the wash. Instead of someone bringing in an oil lamp, we have lights. And we even have our Roman arena, where we have gladiators fighting it out with each other. It's called TV and it's called Question Time, but we still have the same concept of entertainment. And this entertainment isn't provided by slaves, it, it's provided by, it is provided by slaves, but the mechanical slaves. Right, so the two, work, energy, are related. GDP and energy are related. And so it isn't surprising if you look at a plot of energy, world energy, and world GDP over the last couple of hundred years, that the two are very closely related. There's a slight cheat here, which I've, I've included um, energy from wood burning as well, which is uh, not just fossil fuels. But if you include the energy from wood burning, you get 
There's very clear link between the two. And if we look at change of GDP and change of energy over the short term, we also see that in, period, in, in years when energy use is high, we get rising GDP. In years when GDP is lower, we get lower energy consumption. The two go up and down together. And that's very characteristic of two things that are very closely linked together. If we look at countries, uh, it's not, it won't be so clear because, for instance, if you go and buy a calculator or a hi-fi system in this country, it's probably made in China, and so the energy to produce it is in China. So the, the, where something is bought doesn't always necessarily uh, relate to where the energy used to produce it uh, was used. But if you look at countries, you'll see that as a general trend, the higher the GDP, the higher the energy use. And if we look at the, way, the trends per country, we see a similar trend, that they, as countries begin to use more energy, they have more GDP. Now normally, that is assumed that because we're getting richer, we can consume more energy. It's an assumption that, like any other luxury good, we can, we can go out and buy more food if we've got more uh, money, we can go and buy more houses, and energy, therefore, is just a luxury we can go and buy. What I would like to suggest is it's the other way around. Energy isn't a luxury we can go and buy. Energy is something that's necessary for the economy to grow. It's the key critical thing. And the way to explain this is to look at the natural environment. In the natural environment, the primary energy source is the sun. The sun shines down, the grass grows, the grass collects that energy. The grass is then eaten by herbivores. So it's passed, the energy passes from the sun to the grass to the herbivores, then the herbivores are eaten by the carnivores. So the energy is passing through that. And the herbivores, everything eventually all ends up with the fungi, or the parasites, or the collectors of, of, of energy in the natural environment. And very much the sun, the amount of sunshine, the energy of the sun dictates how big that environment is. It's, it's controlled by the sunshine. If you have uh, a dark area in a wood, you get much less life. light. If you have a light area, you, you have a lot more um, life there. And it's very much the same in the economy. The sun is collected in fossil fuels, and those fossil fuels are used, are collected by the mining industries which take that energy. And they have the manufacturing industries which take the raw materials like coal and steel, combine it into products. And we have the retail sector and take, which takes those products and sells it to us. And then we have the bankers, who are the fungi of the society. But in the same way, in the natural system, the energy flows from top to bottom. In the economic system, the energy flows from fossil fuels or primary energy sources through. And we can see that energy is a key part of the cost in raw materials. From this graph, it shows a very clear trend that the cost of raw materials match, or the price of, the yeah, cost of raw materials per kilogram matches the energy used in the, per kilogram. Now, to me, this isn't surprising because most raw materials use a lot of energy, and therefore the cost of energy largely determines the cost of that raw material. And if you're, I've worked in manufacturing, and when you've got primary resources, primary raw materials, and you start combining them together, you're using energy in the manufacturing process to collect it all together and to make it into products. And manufacturing energy is an important cost. And when you get to retail, you've got the um, transportation and other costs. And when you start to gather it all up together, energy becomes the dominant factor in society. It's almost the controlling factor, which is why 
this anaconic idea is so important because energy can be used not just to look at the economy today, but also economies before there was money. So in a, in a primitive society without money, you can look at the energy flows to understand it. So world energy seems to be a proxy for GDP. You can, chat, you can look at GDP and work out energy. You can look at energy and work out GDP. So money and energies seem to be very much the same kind of thing. As I say, energy use does not so much increase as a result of rising GDP, but rising GDP and rising energy use are almost the same thing. Oops, sorry. So, which brings me on to the problem of green economics. If energy use determines the size of the economy, if you start reducing the size of your energy, the amount of energy you have available in society, you're likely to start reducing your GDP. Now here we have a graph showing the United States, the EU, India and China. Now, India in purple and China in brown have rising energy use and they also have rising GDP. Whereas the United States, the EU, they have very flat energy usage. And they have flat economies. The, 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 the GDP is not rising. Now, what I'm suggesting is the reason they're not rising is because the energy use isn't rising. Unless you have cheap energy available, increasing the amount of work you can do in society, you don't have rising prosperity. And the second problem with green economics is that energy saving schemes don't work. The reason, or at least they don't work in terms of reducing energy in society. Because what happens when, for instance, you have a, you insulate your loft, you save energy. Yes, individually you save energy. And what do you do, what does that also mean? You save money. And then what do you do with that money? You go and spend it on other things like petrol for cars or consumer goods, and it takes energy to produce those. And if I'm right that energy and money are very much the same thing, you probably spent as much, you probably consumed as much energy in what you, if you save money, what, uh, the amount of energy you save in the saving scheme is probably the, the same amount as you consume when you transfer that money to something else. So if you save money, you have more money, you spend it and you consume money. And overall, there's no change in the amount of energy. It does mean we're better off because we're not spending money on things we don't need to. We, we can afford that extra thing. So there are benefits in, that in energy saving schemes. But as a way of reducing CO2, it doesn't work. Ooh. Right. In a free market, in a capitalist economy where people are actually free to go and pick the, large, the, 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 the cheapest energy source or the cheapest material, costs are minimized because they will go and cheap, pick the cheapest one. Because cost and energy are related, that also means in a free market, the energy consumed will be minimized. Because the price is minimized, the energy consumed will be minimized. So in a free market, you actually have the most efficient use of energy. So what did the government do? They go and put up energy costs by forcing us to go to alternative energy sources which are more expensive. But what that implies is that extra energy cost must be extra energy. That energy stored up in the steelworks, in the, in the infrastructure, that's extra cost there. So we're constantly told that wind is free. Well, wind is as free as coal, oil, or gas. As I, as I passed along the M80 this morning, I noticed a black seam on one of the bits of rock. If I'd stopped the car, I could have gone out with a hammer and, and, and pulled it out of the, the ground if, uh, if the police would let me or whatever. But it, coal is free when it's in the ground. Wind is free when it's in the air. Oil is free. It's free 
until you start counting the cost of all the iron ore you have to mine in order to produce the wind turbine. <coughs> it's free until you start thinking about the smelting cost of that iron ore. It's free until you start thinking about all the concrete foundations, and concrete involves a huge amount of energy to, produce, to turn it from limestone into concrete. It's free until you start thinking about the roads and the gravel that has to be transported there, and the diggers that have to dig up the roads. And it's free until you start thinking about the infrastructure, the, the pylons that have to be built, the, the, the cables, and the, uh, the electricity, the, the, the transformers and so on. So wind is free until you count the costs. Coal is free until you count the costs. And all those costs involve energy. And the conclusion I have come to is that if energy and costs are linked so interchangeably, if you can buy energy at the cheapest cost, if the extra cost starts to go twice as much as the, as the market price of energy, the amount of energy you're putting, your, your, you've got in your infrastructure costs is getting to a stage where you've got no energy coming out. You're actually spending as much energy building all your infrastructure, running your plant, as you're getting out. Uh, I'm not saying this is a law, this is, this, this, it should be somewhere about twice the cost when your energy costs are around about twice the cost, you're, you're getting to a stage where you're not getting any actual energy out of your production system. So here is a table from an Australian survey, I think that was about 2006, so it's not Scottish, and it shows that coal is at about 18 pounds per megawatt hour. Gas is about 25 pounds, 26 pounds. That's about 38% higher. So the costs involved in producing energy from gas is about 38% higher. That also suggests that the energy used in the infrastructure, the energy consumed, is about 38% of that cost. Hydro, in the Australian example, was even higher at 67%. And their cost for onshore, high capacity wind, was 91%. And that's going very close to that point where the amount of the energy used in the economy to build the wind turbines, have the salesmen, have the, the renewable energy exhibitions, transport the wind turbines to the, to the site, build the foundations. All that energy going in, on average, is getting close to the point where it's the same amount of energy going into doing the wind farms as it's coming out of the wind farms. And when you get to gas and CO2 capture, it's, it's above that twice level. It's more than twice the level. Coal and CO2 capture is even more. And it's very likely at some point there you're reaching the stage where there's less energy coming out of doing this policy than is going in to do the policy in the first place. And when you get to something like photovoltaics, which I think is about three times the cost of coal, you're going to a crazy uh, system. Now, so what would happen if society were mad enough to go for a photovoltaic, photovoltaic supply of energy? The cost of electricity would triple. Because the cost of electricity triples, the cost of energy in general would triple. The cost of all the steel produced, all the, um, all the roads produced, all the energy used in all the infrastructure would, would probably triple. So the cost of a solar panel would triple. So the actual cost there would be nine times the price. Because it feeds through to the economy. That con the, because the cost of energy feeds through to the economy, that cost will then feed through to the cost of producing solar panels, which will raise the price. You get a first time you look at it, it's three. Next time it will be nine. Next time, 27 as it feeds through the economy six time, and you're getting into a vicious cycle of economic decline, and if you went that way, eventually, the lights go out. All right, thank you.